what typically happens in a chemistry class is you're shown the solution to the hydrogen atom, and then you're said, told, and so it goes for the rest of the periodic table. And that's sort of true, but not really. And I thought that what we would do was we would go through how to deal with multi-electron atoms and what the challenges are of multi-electron atoms. The hydrogen atom, you've got just a proton and an electron. Hamiltonian is minus h bar squared over 2m del squared minus the charge on the electron squared r, where r is the distance between the two. And when we solved that, we got uh, a wave function which had four quantum numbers, n, l, m, and m, s. And because we were able to break this up into, uh, into a separation of variables, we had a radial part, which depended on n and l only, a angular momentum part, which depended on l and m only, and a spin part, which depends on ms only, and then our energy eigenvalues are minus 1 over n squared times the Rydberg constant. Now remember this again, we were only solving for the bound states, so any state that was unbound we're ignoring, and then those you know, are important at times, but for this class, is not so critical. Now, if we go from hydrogen to, say, lithium, now we have this plus plus. We got a nucleus that has plus three charge, and then from that. We have three electrons. Uh, now we know that we can use uh, center of mass correction to you know, turn this into a central problem. So we're no longer talking about the center of mass moving, but instead we're talking about the entire uh, uh, atom moving. And we can throw that away and instead just talk about the electrons moving around a central potential. But the central potential has fundamentally changed now because the central potential now has a Hamiltonian that's going to be a kinetic energy part and a little bit of E there because we got rid of the uh, uh, nucleus moving, so it's just the electrons that are moving. Uh, we have a potential, i.e. That's the ion-electron interaction. And now we have a potential, which is E. These are the electron-electron interactions. So these can be written out. Te is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m del 1 squared del 2 squared plus del 3 squared. So that's the kinetic energy which you've seen before. The ion electron term, E I E, is going to be negative 3 E squared over R1 minus 3e squared over r2 minus 3e squared over r3. 
where these R1, R2, and R3 are the distance from the nucleus to each of our electrons. And then the electron electron terms will look like this E squared over R1 minus R2 plus E squared over R2 minus R3 plus E squared over R3 minus R1. And the real problem here is that our Hamiltonian can no longer be broken up into separate, not equal to, H1 plus H2 plus H3, right? Because this third term necessarily couples all of the electron behavior. And because we can't separate the Hamiltonian into parts like this, it means the separation of variables isn't going to work, and we're not going to wind up with a wave function that gives us these nice separable solutions. But let's imagine we could change colors here. We'll kind of track that down for a moment. If the E E equals zero by some miraculous means, then that means that now H is equal to T1 B plus B I E1 plus T2 plus B I E2 plus T3 plus B I E3 H1 plus H2 plus H3. And if you take this and you crank through the math, you'd wind up with a wave function that depends on psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, where each of those are solved for the independent electrons. We would wind up with an energy E1 plus E2 plus E3, and of course, I'm leaving out the quantum numbers here because we know that each one of these would be a fairly involved problem where we uh, solve in uh, spheric coordinates and get multiple quantum numbers for each. But I'm just kind of summarizing this to point out that we would wind up with an eigenfunction, which is a product of eigenfunctions, and an eigenvalue, which is the sum of eigenvalues. And what's more, our final wave function depends on R1, R2, and R3, would have to be properly anti-symmetrized, because now we have two electrons, or we have three electrons, which means that we have to use a Slater determinant to get 1 over square root of 6 psi 1, R1, psi 2, R2, psi 3, R3, Sorry, my mistake. Let me uh, write this lazy form. R1, 1, 1, 1, R2, 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 R3, R3, R3. So we have to properly anti-symmetrize the wave. Where does the 1 over 6 come from? Uh, the 1 over 6 uh, normalizes it. As 1 of the square root of 6 normalizes the final determinant. Because you're going to wind up with uh, 6 terms in this, and each one will have uh, the same uh, weighting. I can't remember what it was. I think it was 1 over the square root of n, I think. No. Sorry, one, 1 over the square root of n factorial. It goes in there. I think, uh, but it's in the it's in the nose for the hydrogen atom. Uh, 
And that's what we get. It would still be a lot of work, and it would still be wrong. But nonetheless, this is, this is where uh, we would start from. So I want to talk about two methods that can be used to get approximate solutions to this uh, problem in which we include the electron-electron interactions. Any questions about what I've put up so far? Okay. But the first method I want to talk about is called the uh, Thomas Fermi approach. This is a uh, really a semi-classical st statistical method to address electron-electron interaction. And, and the second method is called the Hartree or the Hartree-Fock method. So in Thomas Fermi, we replace B I E plus B E E with an effective potential. that takes into account electron uh, screening. And the basic idea is that if you have a nucleus and you've got electrons that are kind of green dots here, that the electrons that are located here, they feel more of the positive charge than the electrons located out here. And that's because the electrons out here, they have the electrons between uh, themselves and the nucleus that adjust themselves to screen the, the electric field. So this is a, a bulk method that uses uh, uh, screening as a means of, of uh, making up for or solving for uh, the electron-electron interactions. And the way that it does this is it transforms the idea of uh, charge or electrons into an electron gas. So now instead of talking about the electrons, I'm talking about an electron that I'm placing somewhere here, and that electron is feeling the effect of an electron gas that sits between it. And this electron gas is represented by charge density. Describe and row R then has a radial dependence. <clears throat> so the density does change as a function of radial position. Uh, but the good news is that at any point. we can treat that little point in space as a uniform electron gas. So you got the year for this? I don't have the year. Okay. We treat this as a uniform electron gas. And that uniform electron gas, at any point, uh, allows us to simplify the uh, math we're doing. Now, if you have a point charge, call that 
big Q uh, in a uniform electron gas. There's a, a potential now changes from the potential, which was the uh, E squared over R, to, right, I should call it E Q Q over R. Uh, you know what, let's not call that Q. Let's call that you know, plus E. Uh, so one positive charge for an electron. Uh, then the screen potential like this. So this becomes this. And the screen potential is called the Yukawa potential. screening length. Right, since it has to be inverse length in order for the exponential to be dimensionless. In essence, what's happening is we are turning our potential from something that does this to something that does this. So we are pushing up potential near the nucleus, you still have a fairly steep drop off, but as you get further away, you're feeling less force attracting the electrons. Now, if you are solving for a charged neutral atom with this anymore, So a charge neutral atom with uh, a central potential, so spherically symmetric, and atomic number Z. type of potential, you wind up with a potential that looks like this. E squared over A 
Dana. And people talk about the Thomas Fermi uh, potential of having this uh, four thirds potential, and that's where it comes from, it's four thirds of the atomic number. This was Thomas Fermi, and uh, back in the day, 1920s, this was the thing to use. And it still is, uh, sometimes. Uh, a naught is just a constant. A uh, naught uh, or radius. What is the exponent on z? Uh, z raised to 4 thirds. So this was the thing to use. Uh, it still finds application many times. Uh, but it's something that, in general, people consider it not accurate enough for uh, wanting to have predictive modeling of, of atoms and bonding. So a better approach came about by uh, Hartree, and then it was corrected by uh, this guy named Falk, and it's called the Hartree Falk. Theory, or the Hartree Fox self consistent field method. And by self consistent field, you solve it self consistently, where you have to guess the wave functions and then solve and then re guess the wave functions and then solve because the wave functions, your solution, is part of your potential. Which you know, kind of makes sense, right? Because your potential depends on the distribution of electrons. Going through this, uh, we're going to be using calculus of variation. It's messy. I don't use it every day or every year for that matter. Uh, and we'll go through it as best we can. Uh, catch me if you see me do something suspect, and I'll try not to. Uh, well, Partry Falk looks like this. I like the left, left board, so I'll, I'll start over on the right. Okay. It starts by assuming that we can write the wave function as a product of single electron wave functions. So it's kind of imposing on us the assumption that the Hamiltonian is separable, and it's not. But we start from that assumption that our wave function can be written out as a product pi equals 1 to n psi i. So it's implying that the Hamiltonian is separable. And if the Hamiltonian is separable, then what does it look like? Well. implies h is equal to sum i over 1 to n h i. And our h i would look like this, minus h bar squared over 2 m del i squared, our kinetic energy term, plus v naught r i plus one half sum i see, j not equal to i n e squared over r i minus r j. Okay, so this term on the right this is the Coulomb interaction between all the electrons summing from J to N. We have N electrons. So. This J not equal to I means that uh, we're throwing away the term in which the electrons interact with the self. So 
it's J is equal to one, two, three, dot, 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 skips over I, and then keeps going. And then all J but not equal to I. And then this one half term is put in there because if you sum the, the first and the fifth electron interacting and the fifth and the first, you're counting twice. So the one half is sort of double counting. And then this second term, these are all the potential terms not involving electron electron. Non E E. So in the case of uh, electrons around an atom, that would be uh, that would be a you know one over R term that talks about the neutron, see the nucleus and the electrons uh, interacting with each other. And this is where it starts. Um, and somewhere in my notes, I've written. Uh, and I'll, I'm still looking for it, but I, I know I've got it somewhere. It's called primer on calculus and variation. And the genre multipliers. class, but it's something which uh, I'm pretty certain it exists, and I'll, I'll post that. But what I want to do is I want to show you how this works within calculus variation and what the final uh, form looks like. So what makes this challenging uh, is that we don't know these functions, and they're going to contribute to this, this Hamiltonian. And you'll see where that comes from, from in a bit here. Uh, we know that from the variational method, that if we're solving for the ground state, that if we find the lowest energy, that we have the ground state. And that means that if we have this function, which is a product of these functions, we can write a functional and minimize the functional. The functional that we're interested in is the energy, which is a functional of the wave function, and it is the integral of psi star h psi dr. So we're integrating over all volume. And solving using genre multipliers, that means we have to have a constrained solution. And the constraint is that the integral of little psi i star psi i dr is equal to 1 for all i. So we're just saying that each single particle wave function has to be, uh, has to be normalized. And that's OK. That, that makes sense. So setting this up using Legendre multipliers, sorry, Lagrangian multipliers, uh, we would wind up with something that looks like this. I'm going to erase this E.
need to subtract there? Here, yes. That's mostly a subtraction. Uh, this is our Legendre multiplier. Sorry, Lagrangian multiplier. And we want to use the calculus of variation to find uh, the functions that make this functional, what we call stationary. So to say that a functional is stationary is to say that it's at an extreme of so It's stationary because either it's a maximum or a minimum. Is that R supposed to be a vector? R, yeah, it's a vector because it's, it's, a, it's a triple integral. So I just, I, just, I just put R, dr vector to mean uh, dr d theta d phi sine theta d, yeah, all of that gets dumped in there. Okay, and so what? And that's supposed to be Lagrangian or Legendre? Oh, sorry, Lagrangian. For whatever reason. Sorry about that. I have the genre on my mind. It's terrible when that happens. <laughs> okay, so let's let's go through an example of of functionals now. And calculus of variation. Functional of two functions, v1 and v2. Come on. And let's write this as an integral. Functional is an integral and it depends on function one, function two, and x. We can say that this functional is stable. You would say that a function, you're at a stable point if small changes to that function doesn't change the value, right? That means you're at the bottom or the top. And it's the same here. Here we would talk about del i is equal to i v1 x plus epsilon 1 eta 1 x v 2 x plus epsilon 2 eta 2 minus i v 1 x v 
two x. So in that, is stationary, or zero, we're stationary. This eta, not eta, but uh, uh, epsilon, it's a constant value, but small. We're putting that in front of our uh, eta functions. And eta is just some arbitrary function that deviates from phi. this out using our integral, using our integral, I'm going to erase above, this is going to become equal to integral f get an approximation of this, uh, we're going to take a McLaren expansion in powers of our uh, epsilon. So, Clarin expansion fx is approximately f zero plus f prime zero plus one over two factorial f double prime f zero plus one over three factorial f triple prime at zero. Okay, so taking this expansion in terms of epsilon, we get this approximately equal to equal to integral of f e1 x1 e2 x2 x plus d f d v1 epsilon 1 eta 1 x plus d f D uh, V two epsilon two eta two x plus higher order terms which you throw away minus 
f v1 x v2 x x and that allows us to throw away this and this just leaving these two terms If I write this, del i is equal to the integral df d v1 del v1 plus df d v2 del v2 is equal to the integral del f. So we call this the variation of the functional f. So in the equation where you cancel things out, what comes after the remainder? Here? Right, what is that? Uh, higher order terms. Higher order. It's higher order terms. So these are all these guys up here. So we're only taking the, the first derivatives. And these I is equal to epsilon I into I. Right? Here and here. And the definition of stability Stability. So let's use our our problem uh, in this context. Sorry, not plus, minus, sorry. 
I'm subtracting. I, I, I'm, uh, I've got a negative sign in front of the sum. So I'm just going to carry that negative in front of each of these terms. Minus, minus epsilon n psi n star psi n dr. So this is our f. in my expression for f as opposed to the regular psi because I, first off I can and second when I get to the end it's going to reduce the algebra moving things around so bear with me and think of it as an aesthetic choice right now uh, and not simply that I'm cheating to skip a step at the end but uh, or you can think of that as well but uh, I know where we're going so I, I chose to use the complex conjugates okay so we've got this and then this means that our EI should be equal to zero. It's equal to the integral of the sum of I'm calling this Q equals one to N DF D psi star Q del psi star q dr. So that maps on to this guy over here. So our del psi q is our uh, uh, small perturbation to our guest wave function. Okay, so we've got this set up correctly now. So let's start solving. Um, I don't need this anymore. And we're going to do that by picking. <coughs> A particular value, you know, this this whole f we can expand, right? It's gonna be huge. But we're gonna pick uh, one particular value. So let's just pick the qth term in the summation. And there's like n of those right now, so yeah, somewhere in the middle there. So this this qth term will look like this. F D psi star Q del psi Q star. Okay. Now if we have our uh, Hamiltonian here. You can say that sum j equals 1 to n of psi 1 star dot 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 d q star psi n star h J, because we're summing over the Hamiltonian, psi 1, psi q, psi n, minus d psi q star
Okay, so this is looking just at the qth term of this expansion. Then this h will have the form negative h bar squared over 2m del squared j plus v naught r j plus 1 half sum k not equal to j over n to n e squared over r j minus r k. So this is going to get substituted in for the Hamiltonian. And again, we're taking the sum over each term of the Hamiltonian. And in this case, this again is our kinetic energy, our uh, V0, and our V E E term. And then for here, we've got our uh, uh, condition, which uh, maintains uh, normal, the normalization constraint. Okay, so in this case, uh, there's two conditions. There's the condition when J is equal to Q, and the condition when J is not equal to Q. Inside the summation, in particular, we're thinking about, about these, they'll look like this. Integrating this, we've got. Am I missing the integral here? Did you mention? I missed the integral. Sorry. This. Where did that integral go? Oh no, the integral. Sorry, the integral is on this board. This term is just one term in the integral. And putting it back into this expression here, which had the integral. Uh, in that case, uh, this goes to zero, and it goes to zero because these two are orthogonal. So that's where the uh, J not equal to Q term goes. So for J equal Q. And in that case, if you take a 
again, this term which I erased and you divide it through by psi star psi, you wind up with, so, yeah. Find, uh, side, uh, then again, just looking at the Q term, you get D psi Q star T Q plus T not Q psi Q. down this way, uh, but so that's these terms, let me, uh, you know what, let's just put it all together, I have no idea, I, but in my, in my notes I split this up into two separate sections, uh, well you know what, I'll, I'll do this anyhow, uh, Q, and the third term here, because because there's a sum inside, this is uh, two, so term three is Q star one half sum K not equal to Q psi K star E squared over R Q plus R K psi K psi Q. Okay, so that's the third term over here. And that's just added on to terms one and two. Yeah. Yeah. So this makes our Stability condition, the fumbling I've done for the past three minutes is to set a bunch of things to zero. And I'm hoping you'll just trust me that you go to zero because I don't necessarily know that I showed it very clearly uh, on the board. But that's why there should be notes to follow. And after you set these things to zero, you wind up with a stability term. Zero is equal to the integral of the sum of the sum q equals one to n del psi q star t q plus b naught q. wind up with. 
And the good news is that this is now something that's separable. And we basically are now simultaneously solving n equations from 1 to n, substituting uh, in for q. And what we're currently solving is this h bar squared over 2m del squared plus p naught r sub d, d sub d, yep, I'll get to that in a second here. Uh, Okay, that's what we're solving. We're solving n of these equations at the same time. Uh, this is called the Hartree equation. This, the d, is called the Hartree term. Where they come from, they come from pulling out these del Q's on the left-hand side, and then pulling this over to the right-hand side. So our energy, this is going to be the right-hand side of our eigenfunction problem. The left-hand side, you've got something that looks like a Hamiltonian, and uh, it, it is its own type of Hamiltonian. Uh, this is uh, 1928. Uh, we've got a kinetic energy term. We've got a uh, potential term that is non-electron electron, and then this Hartree term, which is the electron electron uh, interaction. Now, the electron electron interaction, this Hartree term, is interesting because. We're looking at the kth electron in the Hartree equation. The VD term is a sum over all the electrons except for the kth. So we'll leave the kth one out. And we're putting the charge density in for each of the electrons, not the kth electron. So we're saying, how does the kth electron interact with the charge density of, all the, of each of the other electrons on a term-by-term -term basis? and is the distance times that charge density. Sorry, there has, has to be a star here. Sorry. I was going to ask. You wrote yep. the same thing twice. Yep. So this is the, the charge density of all the other electrons. So this is a very slow process. I mean, actually solving it is, uh, because in order to get the solution, you have to have the solution. And this is solved by an iterative self-consistent approach in which you make some guess, put the guess in, solve for new eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and then iterate back up and, and keep uh, cycling through. Um, it's also worth pointing out that uh, Our epsilons, these are our uh, Lagrange multipliers. And through most, 
it's very common in quantum mechanics for you to be solving a Hamiltonian-like problem. And again, this is not the Schrodinger equation, but it looks a lot like it. Uh, and we're solving for this, uh, and Lagrangian multiplier is the energy term. Uh, in, in the case of the cohen sham uh, equations for density functional theory, this is exactly what you're solving for. You're solving for uh, a potential, which is a functional of the dense, charge density, and you have your Lagrange multipliers, which normalize your uh, eigenfunctions, and that is what your energy term comes from. Uh, so the Hart tree put this out in 1928, and it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is the exchange is wrong. Right? It, it doesn't symmetrize, does not anti-symmetrize the electrons. So that's where uh, Falk and Slater came about. Falk was so involved with this? Uh, no, that was Hartree. So Falk and Slater in 1930 made a correction to the Hartree expression. same again, you're solving n of these simultaneously, one for each of the electrons in the system, and now that is an exchange potential, and the evaluation of the exchange is this. People refer to this as the one third exchange. Uh, the expectation value of the exchange energy is one half some i not equal to j integral, double integral, psi. Psi one star R I Psi J star R J E squared over R I minus R J Psi I R J Psi J R I D R I D R J. Note here I J. So this is I I J J. This is I J J I. So compared to this one, they swap positions. So we're looking at the energy to swap electrons from one position to the next, which you know, physically, what we think of when we think of exchange. And this is uh, really the, the method that was hot for a long, long time. 
Uh, it was expensive. Uh, it was time consuming. It got things kind of, sort of, oftentimes right. 